Nikhil, how's it going, man? Good, good to, to see you. Good to see you too. Come on in. Watch out for all the uh, the chicken poop. That's the latest thing with these chickens is that there's just like poop everywhere. Definitely used to avoiding chicken poop. They're not uh, old enough to produce eggs yet. Okay. So now it's just poop or fertilizer. <laughs> Here, come on in. All right. Welcome to Device Squad, everybody, the podcast for the mobile enterprise from Propellix. Device Squad, fighting crimes against enterprise mobility worldwide. Bad UI, frustrating user experiences, poorly conceived mobile strategies, we defeat them all. This podcast series will cover all aspects of enterprise mobility including strategy, development, design, testing, and more. My name is Steve Brickman. I'm a mobile strategist and UX architect with Propellix. First, a brief history of the company. Founded in 2011, Propellix is a mobile strategy consultancy helping enterprises worldwide devise true mobile strategies and develop world-class mobile applications across all industry verticals. Propellix clients include large companies like Amway, Bright Horizons, Bank of Montreal, Dubai Airports, Family Dollar, DLL, Cintas, Merck, and many more. Propellix menu of services includes eight different mobile kickstarts covering everything from mobile strategy and road mapping to MCOE to UI UX design to mobile testing strategy, along with soup to nuts app design development and support. Additionally, Propellix offers three homegrown enterprise mobile products. Today I have with me my friend Nikhil Patel. This is a good story. We actually met at a friend's party, and she also happens to have chickens, coincidentally. Yes, she does. Hers are bigger <laughs> and louder and a lot more aggressive. Yes, they are. Than mine are. But they but they lay eggs. So. And they lay eggs. Yes. Yeah. And uh, did you see that one of them like ate like an entire hot dog like in one gulp? <laughs> no, like, I did grabbed not. Grabbed it out of, I think it was Sadie who had the hot dog. Grabbed it out of her hand. Just mm -hmm. Those things are beasts. And um, so we were just uh, rapping at the party and Nikhil told a story um, about his recent experiences overseas that I thought was just would be great for the podcast not necessarily like specifically enterprise today but i think we'll learn a lot of things that can inform enterprise practices and so forth uh, around healthcare and mo mobility and healthcare so uh with that nikhil why don't you just uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and sure. how you got to where you are sure so right now I'm a second year doctoral student at Tufts University. Um, I'm getting my PhD in civil and environmental engineering with a focus on environmental health. And it's a very funny, interesting program to be in, sort of given all of the work and the space that I've come from. Um, but the reason why I ended up in this program at Tufts is because my advisor works on issues around access to clean water in low resource settings. And I come from sort of a global health practitioner, program manager, researcher background. I've been working in global health for basically the past 10 years. I've had a variety of experiences on the African continent. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Togo, West Africa. I worked in Kenya for a year on a large randomized control trial looking at the effects of water sanitation hygiene and nutrition on child health outcomes and right before i moved to boston i was living in northern nigeria for a year and a half where i worked for an ngo um, named eHealth africa um, that was focused on sort of implementing technology solutions um, within healthcare systems and i was there building out a research department to help them sort of understand how to use this data that they were collecting in the field to improve programs and to improve their local health systems. And I think even though the work that I'm doing right now, my PhD program is not specific to technology and global health, I think we've gotten to a point where technology is just part of 
what we have to think about when we're building systems and programs. So I'm always looking for opportunities to sort of find ways to bring in mobile data collection or different technology tools to look at how that can help projects that we're working on as it relates to improving the health of people around the world. That's awesome. So how did your mobile tools change depending on which project you were on? Did you see like an evolution just went from start to finish? The technology, the tools that we use were very sort of specific to whatever the project was. I think there's sort of this false idea that technology needs to be the solution when rather it needs to be the tool that will help you achieve your outcome. So I think programs really need to think about what is it they're trying to achieve and then how can technology help them achieve that more efficiently, more sustainably. There's been a lot of talk about like, oh, like let's create this app and this app can be prescribed as a drug and then people will use the app and things will get better. And it's like, okay, well, yes, that's a great idea in theory, but in practice, technology should be the way to deliver the information, but not the end all be all solution as it is. It should be part of a larger holistic approach to treating a specific disease or a constellation of diseases. So basically you're saying that the 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 delivery mechanism should still be a human being, a live interaction, is that what you're saying? Whereas and the phone should just be maybe more a diagnostic tool or Um I mean and again I think it depends on sort of what the project you're trying to think about. So just as an example, um yesterday I was in a meeting with my research group and we were talking about how can we collect real-time data on self-reported cases of diarrhea? And we had a whole discussion around what are the indicators that matter? Is it just have they had a case of diarrhea in the past week? What is the duration? What was the severity? Did the family have to take the, the sick person to the hospital? What was the treatment? And we were looking at how to sort of teach a community health worker to go and collect this information and I was trying to design a paper form that they would be able to use. And we sort of came to this idea that like, well, depending on what we want to try and collect, maybe a mobile tool might be more efficient. So again, a person will still need to be using the phone and they'll need to be trained on how to ask the right questions. But rather than having this complicated form on a sheet of paper that might be very confusing to interpret and read, especially in a different context when it's not written in English, um, maybe if they had a smartphone or a tablet and they had some kind of mobile data collection application that they could then enter the information and then it allows for a lot more flexibility in the way that you ask questions and the kind of data that you can collect. Sure. So let's just back up a little bit because you mentioned something that it was interesting and I don't think a lot of people realize it, but like how widely disseminated is mobile technology in the areas that you were working? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, I think something that's very unique to the African continent is the fact that a lot of the telecommunications networks have bypassed landlines and gone straight to mobile technology. So if you sort of think about the evolution of communication in sort of more Western settings like the United States, you think of like we had phones that sat in our houses and we had a number for our house and you could call someone. Then they had cell phones, and then we had computers, and then computers and phones got integrated into sort of smartphones and tablets and all these new technologies that we have right now. Whereas in Africa, they've sort of benefited from the fact that these technologies already exist. So while there is penetration of landlines in Africa, a lot of people have gone directly jumping from having no real technological tools for communication to most people owning a smartphone or most people owning some kind of mobile phone, whether it has features or, or does not have features. Right. Um, and, and, and just, I mean, so a lot of the places that I'm working in also are places where even though these technologies exist, the infrastructure has been slow to catch up. So while it's possible that a large proportion of people have smartphones, if the telecommunications companies haven't built towers to support that, then you're going to have a lot of issues with reception and, and connection. But just as an example, specifically, I was reading um, a couple months ago, but the country of Burma, Myanmar, um, they actually have the highest mobile penetration rate in the world, um, which is amazing considering that just a couple of years ago, Myanmar was basically a closed country economically, 
And I think basically within three to five years, they've jumped from zero mobile penetration to almost 90 plus percent mobile penetration, which is incredible to think about that basically every household in Myanmar has access to some kind of mobile yeah. communication device. That's amazing. I mean, we've seen the evolution of the technology. So the technology feels very like logical given the history, but I'm amazed that they just are sort of given these like phenomenal devices, you know, and they're just adopted. I mean, what is like the learning curve on that? Like <laughs> going from zero to, you know, an iPhone or whatever. Sure. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think the learning curve just sort of depends on what you're asking the person to do. Most of us feel like the iPhone or some kind of smartphone is pretty ubiquitous in, in a country like the United States. Yeah. Um, but I think the phone that's probably the most ubiquitous in a lot of lower resource settings are sort of these smaller... So I remember that when I uh, entered the Peace Corps, the first phone they gave us was this like little Nokia very reminiscent of like some of the first phones that we used to have yeah and like it has a little screen you can enter numbers you could play snake on it but i think one of the coolest things about it was that it actually had a flashlight which is very very useful when i was in a country where there was often no access to electricity in right. some parts of the country where i was going to so it was nice to have a flashlight attached to my phone mm -hmm. which was great but then i finally saw the iphone um, and smartphones added that feature which has been very very nice but i think mobile phones while they're not necessarily the most intuitive to use, I think depending on what you're trying to have someone do, if it's just type this number and call someone, then I think that's pretty easy. And I think even texting and SMS messages have also become pretty easy to use. Now, of course, you have a lot of issues around literacy. A lot of the languages have sort of come up with like short codes um, or abbreviations that people are able to use mm -hmm. to be able to communicate either through voice or or SMS. Now, when it comes to sort of more complicated, and I'm going to use complicated in quotes because that's going to depend on sort of the learner and what you choose to describe something as complicated or complex. Yeah, I mean, there will definitely be a learning curve depending on what you're asking somebody to do and depends on what is the UX or the UI of the actual application and then how well somebody is trained to use something. Mm -hmm. So I think the learning curve will sort of depend on what you're asking the user to do. But for the most part, I found that under ideal circumstances, if you were to design a great training and teach someone how to do something, most people are able to understand pretty, pretty clearly. It makes sense. I mean, I think of my kids. Yeah. And they don't know that we had a Commodore 64 or whatever. <laughs> that way you could, it had 12K or whatever, you know, so. And they uh, pick it up faster than we do, I think. Anytime something new comes out, they definitely learn learn it quicker than we do. So Yeah, and, and I think also, like, I think humans are innately curious people. So yeah. um, whenever you have something new in front of you, you have a tendency to want to explore and see what happens. So I think applications that sort of make it very easy to explore and find new features um, or new tools or things that you can do with it, I think um, those tend to be the most successful. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine that there's like a hunger for it and a wonderment and a level of amazement that's probably higher than we have. Um, and so how are people charging their devices? Where are, they, <laughs> are they using like solar battery chargers or um I, so again that sort of depends on the location and i will give my experience based off of the context that i've worked in um i mean for the most part i think people are using chart i mean they use chargers that are connected to power grids mm -hmm. um i mean a lot of places do have access to either some kind of power grid or a generator that pr that produces electricity um, I think there was this idea that solar chargers are going to revolutionize the way people charge tools in the African continent. And for the most part, I think while there are specific use cases for it, I think as infrastructure has gotten better over time, it has become a lot easier to just charge through a power grid or a generator rather than a solar charger. Now, what those charging stations look like is definitely very interesting. People have even built businesses around wow. charging stations that people in a community can go take their phone, drop their phone off. There'll be a multiple plugs and then you pay basically to charge your phone and then it, it can then become a business opportunity, which I think is a very entrepreneurial yeah. thing that I think is very unique to some of the places that I've been to. I would never have imagined that kind of business model working 
here in the U.S. But right. then, but then again, you have seen charging stations pop up. Yeah, that, airports, that, 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 airports and that you can pay for. Yeah. Um, but the first place that I ever really saw them was in Kenya and Togo, where people would sort of like have a generator and then have a bunch of outlets, and people would just give their phones. Wow. Um, especially since there's so much sometimes variability in when electricity might be running in, in a specific yeah. community. That's really, really cool stuff. So what were some of the big takeaways from your trip? And I'd love it if you could just segment it into each sure. different assignment. One of the first big takeaways, and I think I've, I've sort of mentioned this earlier, is this idea that technology is ubiquitous. It's just become a part of our life. And I think, like I said before, we've had this tendency to want to see technology as the solution rather than it just being a tool to help us achieve whatever goal we want achieved. And technology should really just be a way to help make things easier, make things more effective, and most importantly, make things more sustainable. So really finding ways of saying the solution to curing diabetes or to curing Ebola or stopping the transmission of malaria is not some cool fancy app or some cool fancy tool, but rather a holistic program that looks at what are the causes, where does the disease come from, how is the disease spread, how is it controlled, and then what are places you can sort of inject technology to make things easier. And I think also a lot of it depends on easier for whom, easier for the user and by whom. Is it the mm -hmm. government? Is it an NGO? Is it a private organization? Um, the sort of an interplay between the user and who is providing that service. And then that will sort of drive how technology should be integrated into the program. So that's probably my first big takeaway. Uh, my second is I think mobile technology or technology in general is growing at such a fast rate that I've sort of seen this idea that people are trying to build solutions for now rather than building solutions for the future. Um, and I think the moment you try to build a technology solution for now, you're already going to be behind the curve mm -hmm. um, just because, sort of because of the delay in the transfer of technology between the West and countries in Africa or countries in Southeast Asia. I remember a specific example where we were trying to build sort of a communication platform in one of the states in Nigeria and we were using immunization as sort of a case for doing this. But we saw this communication platform as being something that could really be used for not just immunization, but really any sort of siloed health sure. issue, whether it was HIV AIDS, whether it was malaria, whether it was diarrhea, et cetera. And the tool that we were training people on were sort of these little smartphones. And I think they were talking about, OK, well, then maybe the next step is a tablet that everyone gets a tablet to be able to communicate. But there was sort of this idea that like, OK, let's think about how do we build a system that it works for a smartphone now, but in 10 years from now, tablets are going to become, or some other new de device is going to become as ubiquitous as the smartphone. So how do we build the system in a way that will allow for sort of changes in technology over time? And given how much there's more penetration of these newer technologies, yeah. we should really be building for what is the system going to look like in five years, in 10 years? Um, not what does the system look like right now. So um, those are probably two of the biggest takeaways that I've had. And then third is also I think there's an, a tremendous need for infrastructure. Infrastructure, I think, really is sure. the biggest barrier to a lot of these technological solutions working. If you don't have network connection, if you don't have roads, if you don't have electricity, those kinds of things can really be a barrier and I think a lot of the things that we try to do in global health sometimes can feel very like band-aids because the infrastructure isn't there yet. But if we just invested in infrastructure, which is not as sexy as some other yeah. um, things that people want to invest in, um, then I think we could see something that's a lot more sustainable. It's all about moving the data. Yeah. So just to uh, get some background, what years were you there again? Just so I can think technology-wise sure. what was happening yeah. here. Yeah, so I was in Togo from 2008 to 2010. Uh -huh. I was in Kenya from 2013 to 2014. And then I was in Nigeria from 2014 to 2015. Okay. And then between that, I was in at UNC Chapel Hill for two years getting my master's in public health. Mm -hmm. so. so looking forward... Now, like augmented reality is all the rage and mm -hmm. wearables and sensor technology, sensor yeah. technology. Was that a part of the discussion? 
Yeah, I remember a conversation that I had in one of these sort of brainstorming meetings, and I we were talking about the same platform that I was discussing earlier in Nigeria, and I think one post-it note we had put on was like, okay, year one, year two, year three, year five, drones. How can we integrate drones into, <laughs> yeah. into this? Where is a place that we think drones could be a really useful piece to get vaccines out to hard to reach areas and things like that. But actually already we were we were testing out different things related to sensors. There's a company out of California. They had basically designed this tool to monitor temperature remotely through sensors. Um, and what they what we were using it for was we were installing the sensors inside cold storage units, which basically house vaccines. You need to keep vaccines at a very specific temperature for them to be viable. If it gets too hot, they become ineffective. If it gets too cold, they can also become ineffective. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're working in sort of these conditions in low resource settings where you don't have consistent access to electricity, um, there are power outages, or maybe there's power surges that, that can destroy generators and things like that, you want to make sure that the vaccines don't get destroyed because they're very valuable commodities. So basically, someone had invented a sensor, which I think are sort of tools that we just assume exist um, for current cold chain um, systems that we have here in, here in the U.S., but this has not really been implemented in some of these low resource settings. So we were installing these sensors in these storage units, um, and then whenever the temperature would go above a threshold or below a threshold, we would receive an SMS message from it. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking about what does the system look like? Who is the person that needs to receive this information? How do we train people to then respond to the information? Um, who is paying for this system? Um, so these are all questions that we had, and that really relies upon, okay, well, if the government is responsible for this, then we need to train the right people in the government. But right now, we just want to sort of get an estimate of, like, how does this work? What is the fluctuations that we're seeing in temperature? As an organization, how would we respond? And then we can use that to then translate that into a system that can be used by the government. So I think there are little case studies here and there that I have seen of how sort of these newer um, technologies are being used. Um, I think I also remember reading a story about how people were using augmented reality or sort of virtual reality to teach. I think I've seen it much more in sort of the education space um, of how can we use mm -hmm. virtual reality devices to teach important concepts. Um, and I think there's sort of small pilot examples. So I think there are people who are looking at how to do those things. And it's good that we think about that because these are the technologies that will also become ubiquitous within five to 10 years. But we really need to find people who are willing to sort of take the chance and try them out and figure out what that will look like. Yeah. And then thinking about it from a systems perspective of who's going to be responsible for these systems and then how are we going to pay for it. What was like the most prevalent use case that you saw? Was it around, you know, clean water or? From the user perspective, the most common use case is still sort of just communication. So the same way that we use a phone to call someone or text someone, I think that's how most people are getting their information um, and even health information. I think people are calling their friends um, or texting their friends. Um, I mean, I think there have been some instances of organizations building out programs where you can like text a number and they'll send health information through that. Mm. Almost like simplified versions of iPhone apps and things like that. Yeah. Sort of like they're a few years behind. And so yes. this is the technology that's exactly. available. Yeah. Um, but then at the same time, smartphones are also becoming more and more prevalent. So with that means that people have access to the internet and then once you have access to the internet, then you have a whole trove of yeah. health information available to you. Um, so there have been groups that have tried to design web applications that people can access to find information um, because the internet can be both a very positive but also a very scary place if you don't know what you're looking for and how to look for something correctly. Sure. The other use case that I've seen is sort of, and there's, I mean, this is a little bit of a debate that's happening right now is right now here in the U.S. you probably have a mobile phone plan and it includes data, which means that whenever you purchase your phone and you're able to use the phone, that means you can typically call, text, and then you can also access the Internet. 
Um, but in a lot of these low resource settings, you use more of a credit system. So you end up buying credit and then you can apply the credit to however you want to use that credit. So it can either be to make voice calls, mm -hmm. it can be used to um, send SMS messages, or it can be used to connect to the internet, to whatever kind of um, data signal is available, which means that internet can be expensive. And people, if their main use of a mobile phone is to communicate with their family or to communicate with their friends, then typically they're gonna invest their credit in talk and text. So if people want to actually use it for internet purposes, then it can be expensive. So there's sort of been this idea that what if you can create these free portals that are very guarded by private companies? So Facebook is doing a lot of this. I think it's called Free Basics. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's basically a portal, like a, you would open up your Facebook application, but then it would work and you'd be able to use Facebook. And then through that, you'd be able to access specific sites um, to access pieces of information. What does Facebook get out of that? Just like um, they're going to push advertising and they're going to make revenue on that side of it? or I think there's definitely the financial business side, which is that they can push advertising specific to whatever um, geographic location they're working in. Right. Um, it builds goodwill towards Facebook. So I think it also yeah. provides sort of like a corporate social responsibility type um, feeling of, hey, we're Facebook and we're giving away free internet type thing. Yeah. So I think there's sort of dual purposes to it. But I think, I mean, I, I mean, Zuckerberg did his drive across the nation and meet people. And I think he has sort of these grandiose visions for what a utopian society can look like. So I think from his perspective, he's seeing like, okay, everyone should have access to the internet because internet is a right. But I think at the end of the day, as Facebook is a private company, there has to be some kind of way to monetize that and bring in revenue for his shareholders. Yeah. So while that might not be his main purpose, I think as a company, that is sort of what they're seeing as the value of it is that they're bringing in new customers and eventually those customers might be able to purchase internet and then they'll use Facebook um, or they can have advertisers advertise specifically through um, the specific portal. So. Sure. Um, but basically the idea is like you can, you can have access to the, to Facebook and the internet, even if you haven't paid for any internet credit. Mm. So it's basically free access to the internet, but you have to enter it through a specific door. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, it's the Facebook app, which then sort of controls what information you're actually able to access. So there are sort of pros and cons around freedom of information, yeah, that's freedom of privacy, how much Facebook is going to be able to sort of use that information to then drive decisions they're making about business or yeah. whatever. Uh, but then there are also opportunities for health organizations to get involved and create their own portals to the Internet. But then that means the burden uh -huh. of the cost goes towards those companies to design and pay for that Internet whenever people are using it. That's very interesting. Yeah, and that's a completely different model than we have. Yeah, it, exactly. Um, and it's it's gotten some traction in India, where obviously there's a very large population, yeah. and the companies haven't necessarily been able to keep up with the with the need um, by building enough towers or whatever. So that seems to be a growing emerging market for how people are accessing the internet. But again, then for those who do have access to the internet, who are paying for it then you have the whole internet at your disposal. And like I said before, that's both good and bad. So making sure people are sort of pushing the right health information. That's probably most of the use cases that I've seen. The other one is sort of just using smartphones and tablets to collect data. Um, and that's sort of more what I've seen most because that's sort of my time in Kenya and Nigeria was really more focused on data collection. So I was very involved in how are we able to collect data in the field and a lot of it is using sort of very simple tools developed, for example, a free tool that we use is Open Data Kit. Mm -hmm. And Open Data Kit has sort of formed the basis for a lot of other tools such as Demagi and Survey CTO that are built off of it and create a platform of tools that people can use to collect data. So when you say data collection, you're talking specifically of just like text data, your the survey data. That... So yeah, I'm talking specifically about survey data. So if I am a data collector and I want to go to a household and collect information, yeah. then I would use a smartphone or a tablet as my interface. And there's an application I would open up and then all the questions would show up and you could add skip patterns and you can have multiple choice questions or 
you can you can collect a GPS point. There's all kinds of different mm-hmm. things that you can do now that are all integrated into the same system once you sort of use the mobile tool as your device for collecting the information. Are you adding like photography or taking pictures yeah, of the area? Yeah, exactly. Video, so, yeah, and... exactly. So one of the surveys yeah. we did, we went house to house. Um, we had to collect the GPS point for the house. We asked mm-hmm. the household a couple of questions and they were also taking pictures of like the streets or um, different things around the house to better understand what sort of things were in the house to understand socioeconomic mm-hmm. status. Mm-hmm. What does their water access look like? Sort of give a sense for what the neighborhood looks like. Just yes. General so, living conditions. Li- yeah. and Exactly. Yeah. I mean, so a lot of these yeah. tools have a lot a great number of features so you can collect gps you can take pictures you can enter information sometimes you can even record information all within the same application sure from a more research standpoint that's more what i've been exposed to is sort of using those types of tools and i think that sort of seems to be a very common way to go out and collect information were you using that to identify like vectors of disease transmission and things like that or possible possible vectors or... um yeah to an extent um i mean again the these data collection tools are tools that have to be part of a larger system for how we're trying to find something so for example the company that i worked for nigeria eHealth africa we had gotten involved in supporting the ebola response in nigeria um, and then eventually also built out offices in guinea liberia and sierra leone to support ebola response there But one of the first tools that we developed and that was sort of built off of other tools that we had developed for a different use case for polio, um, which was the majority of the work that we were originally working on before the Ebola epidemic hit Nigeria, was basically we developed this quick survey that basically asked a couple of pieces of information. The data collector would go and collect the person's temperature. They would ask about what symptoms you have been um, exhibiting over the past 24 to 48 hours. Um, who have you been in contact with? What is the GPS point of where the person's living? And then that would tie into a larger system where people would have all this information. So basically we're using it for contact tracing to try and understand um, if we know somebody who was infected with Ebola and we wanted to know, okay, who are all the people that you know who you might have come in contact with? We were monitoring them to see if they also um, had symptoms to know then who the next person might be. So Mm -hmm. again, it was just an easier way to collect that information rather than having sheets of information that you would go out to the field, write into a sheet, then you'd have to come back and you'd have to enter it in Excel and then enter it into a larger database and then run analysis, whereas this is more real-time data collection that we can do, which in a scenario like Ebola response was very critical because the faster you're able to identify somebody as being sick, the sooner you can get them into treatment and hopefully prevent the death and be able to manage the case better. And was there a lot of analysis going on on a mass scale with that data? Like, were you able to create like heat maps and things like that of where infection was? Yeah. So again, this was sort of tied into larger systems that we were building or were integrated into systems that the CDC and other health organizations had already built. Um, So yeah, so we were, I think one of the unique things about eHealth Africa was the fact that we had a geographic information systems team, a GIS team that was able to sort of take data and convert it into maps and create maps that people could use to sort of identify where things were happening. So yes, we were able to sort of create heap maps and get a sense for, okay, here are where all the different cases are, here are where all the different contacts are, and we can see in real time any moment that we collect data from someone, whether a case turns in, whether a contact turns into a potential case. Um, And you can see that visually rather than just having to look at it numerically. And then how do you build dashboards such that people can use that to then sort of see in different pieces of information and make connections around what's happening from like a big picture perspective. So that sort of was happening at these emergency operations centers, which are these sort of like large central commands basically for disease outbreaks. So people from NGOs, from the CDC, from WHO, we're all working there together. Everyone has different sort of roles they were playing in social mobilization and laboratory stuff. Um, And then all the information was sort of being transmitted onto a dashboard that people could sort of see everything in real time and then make decisions from all the data being collected. What I think is really interesting is given this new propensity for our environment to uh, become violent and unpredictable with all the, the hurricanes now and everything, how can we use 
all that information and apply it to say, you know, what's happening in, in Puerto Rico now mm -hmm. and even in Florida, you know, on the mainland where mm -hmm. now this this is going to become more of an issue. Sure. So I think the, the nice thing is the work that we're doing, we're a little bit behind the curve in Africa, but a lot of these systems actually already exist in places like Puerto Rico and Florida. And I think that's why we're starting to see that even though these horrible, horrible um, natural disasters are occurring, while there might be destruction physically, we're actually not seeing as many deaths as we would expect because people are having early warning systems, because we are having slightly better infrastructure, because we have response teams that can go in and have been doing this for so long and yeah. have been learning from it. Um, but I think some of the new things that we're trying to figure out how to do is um, there's a great book that I read by this guy who's a graduate from the Fletcher School at Tufts. Um, it's called Digital Humanitarians. And basically, it's looking at how are people using technology to address complex humanitarian emergencies. Yeah. Um, and a lot of what he talks about is, okay, how can we use drones? What is the utility of drones in an emergency? How can we co collect real-time information, spatial data to be able to understand what does the destruction look like? How can we use drones to deliver supplies? How can we use drones to maybe carry a Wi-Fi signal to then allow oh. people to have access to mobile technology if a tower is down? Um, there's also a lot of there was a lot of chapters looking at social media and how are people using social media to warn people of different things that are that are going on. So after the earthquake in Haiti, someone went down, install, um, set up a short code, and then basically people could text the short code whenever they needed. So they would record and say, "Hey, I'm trapped under the rubble, or um, we need water, or." someone has it, there's dead bodies or um, my house is demolished or we need medical care, et cetera. So I remember looking at all these SMS messages, like the texts of them to just sort of, and we were helping sort of classify what kinds of help people were requesting. So the fact that we even have access to the, this information is very, very useful. Yeah. And then the, I think the next step is sort of figuring out how can we build systems because of social media, there's a million billion data points that could be happening at a given time. So how do you find the needle in the haystack? How do you find the signal and the noise? How do you find the piece of information that you need in order to respond to it? Um, so, and then how can we build systems that are able to search for those things and know what to right. look for? So yeah. these intelligent systems that can data mine for the correct information. So I think that's sort of where yeah. that's going. And I think there's also a lot of questions that he brings up in the book around sort of ethics and there have been cases of people reporting false information so how do you deal with that yeah. um so i think there's a lot of questions and we're not quite there but i think the systems are are being built and i think not only is the developing world learning from western countries but i think western countries are also learning from the developing world so for example like haiti after the earthquake they built something called the crisis map to basically um, geocode different things that people were asking for and people could check in. And I think crisis maps have now become much more common in, in different things. People are using them to map violence election in Kenya. Um, they were using it to map protests in Russia, but then they were using it for typhoon relief in Philippines. And then now um, I think even for Harvey and for Florida, there were crisis maps that were developed so people could send information there um, about where they needed help. So I think social media and how can we sort of bring a more participatory approach to the way that we respond to disasters, I think is sort of the next level of where we're all moving to. And I think we've started to see some really good strides, but I think the next big questions are, how do we deal with the data? Well, obviously lots of issues around data security and data privacy. Sure. How do we deal with false data? How do we manage the data? Um, and then how do we make these systems sustainable and then who, and get the right people to be sort of owners of these systems such that they're responsible for making sure these systems work whenever a natural disaster or a complex emergency occurs. And you mentioned drones. Did you work with drones uh, directly yourself? No, it, it was always a pipe dream. Um, yeah. I would have loved to have some experience with drones. One of our program managers, he really loves digging into technology. So I think he had bought a drone and he had used it to take some aerial images because the NGO that I was working for in Nigeria, we were trying to build a new office. 
So he ended up taking a drone to be able to map the, the area that we were trying to build a new office and get a sense for what the office would look like. Um, and then he was taking aerial screenshots mm -hmm. as the office was being built to sort of document the progress. So, I mean, that was more just sort of a personal fun yeah. anecdote, um, not necessarily tied to the work that we were doing, yeah. but I think it was more just, a, okay, let's figure out how this technology works and then we can then think about use cases for it. But again, even drones, I mean, it's nice to see that um, a lot of countries are now seeing what technologies are going to be entering their countries and having to come up with, okay, we need to have some kind of like national laws or policies around the use sure. of these things because we want to make sure that people are using them ethically and for good. I mean, in a country like Nigeria that is dealing with terrorism, we want to make sure that people who are using drones are using them for good purposes and it's not the terrorists that are using the drones sure, for yeah. whatever they might use a drone for. So Nigeria now has like a code of policies that you have to follow if you want to bring a drone into the country in order to do anything, um, anything with it. And so these are good, but it means that countries have to be proactive about building these systems. I think a lot of countries are going through developing how can we build policies around the use of mobile health in their countries and how can we integrate information communication technology into the government or into the health system. And you need to have sort of like government policies around what that looks like. So I think countries are starting to get on board and develop sort of these policies and standardize them and implement them and then enforce them. So that way when new organizations try to come in, everyone's doing it in a way that's standardized and can allow for interoperability. That's like the next buzzword is interoperability is how do we build systems that it should not be device specific or program specific, but you can sort of interchange pieces. Sure. Um, so we're having a lot of conversations on interoperability right now um, and what that means for a lot of these contexts. Are companies like Apple, are they cooperating with that direction? I mean, it seems like Apple is sort of trying to, you know, they own the Apple Watch, they own the sensors, they own the way that data is presented, and they've done all the legwork, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in terms of HIPAA compliance and things like that. And do you feel like that's going to conflict with this sort of interoperability concept? Like, are those two things, are they working together? Yeah. So, I mean, so at the end of the day, Apple is a business and they have to protect their technology and their software. And I, and I think we all understand that. And I think that actually is one of the reasons why Android has seen much more penetration mm -hmm. um, because they are a lot more open. Mm -hmm. Now, there are obviously pros and cons to Apple versus Android, but I think interoperability means whether you come to something with an Apple device or whether you come to something with an Android a device using an Android platform, both should be able to be integrated into the system sure. uh, if you want to make sure that you're not putting up barriers because anytime you put up even the smallest of barrier that's one less person one less yeah. group that's going to be able to work with something and if you really want to reach 100 percent, if you want to reach everyone then you have to create a system that will work for everyone and not everyone's going to come to the table with the same device or the same technology so how do you build systems that allow you to speak to different right. technologies? Yeah. So I think that's where interoperability comes in is such that Apple shouldn't necessarily need to change their software or how it works, but whatever is sort of the central system should be able to read from Apple as easily as it's able to read from another device. Yeah, so it's really more a matter of coming up with a universal data format a universal data format or picking a format and then making sure you can convert between both formats. Right, um, right, right. This is a little yeah. bit outside of my area of expertise. Yeah, sure. um, but again, this is the idea of like, just because we all speak different languages, there still needs to be a central way. And even if, yeah. I mean, as a world, we sort of identified English as being the primary language that most people are trying to learn. But at the end of the day, you're going to come to places where people don't speak English and you have to find a way to translate between that. So it's sort of, figuring out, okay, either we come up with some shared language that, that nobody uses and it's just like, but Esperanto, but, but, yeah, Esperanto that brings yeah. in everything together yeah. or you pick one and then make sure whatever doesn't speak that can convert whatever they have into the standard language. Mm. There's always the universal language of love yes. also, <laughs> but that's a little harder to, uh, a little harder to quantify yeah. and yeah. use from a technology perspective. <laughs> yes.
I'd love to know if was there any like single use of the technology and it can be you know sms technology any technology even if it's been around forever or whatever that you witnessed and was really impressed by just the ingenuity of the way that that was being used i mean honestly i'd have to go back to the little nokia phone that i got when i was in peace corps the addition of a flashlight onto the phone was I, I kept joking like whoever decided to put a flashlight onto that phone should win a Nobel Prize because it you wouldn't like think that a flashlight and a phone should ever be the same device. But the amount of times that I end up being so grateful that I just had my phone on me and was able to use it as a flashlight was invaluable and these are phones that don't have cameras yeah they exactly they don't have cameras they ha i mean i think maybe my phone had like the game snake on it or whatever yeah. but it was like a very simple we call them dumb phones but they're really non-feature phones sure but the one feature was a flashlight yeah and the fact that i had that was very very helpful that's probably the one phone or one type of phone that is most prevalent in a lot of low resource settings, mainly because they're very inexpensive, but also they're very durable. Like I remember I've, mm -hmm. dro I've dropped that phone so many times. And while I feel like I have to be a lot more careful with my iPhone, these phones, I could drop it a hundred times and I know that it would be perfectly mm -hmm. fine. So I think just the fact that it was how durable it was for the scenarios and situations that I was living in, and then the fact that it had a flashlight, I think was very, very useful yeah. to me. And that's the phone that most people probably have. And while there was no internet connection, you could still make voice calls. You could still receive SMS messages. So people were still using those phones within help programs because you could text the message or there's something called interactive voice response where um, you could set up a system where basically you could do surveys or data collection over the phone where someone would basically call you with a computerized voice and say, ask you your questions oh, yeah. and you respond and it would be collected qualitatively. So that was another form of data collection that was being used. And you could do that with this phone. And that's an interesting method of getting around this lack of internet by letting people SMS a certain code to a certain number or whatever, and then the information is pushed to them. Mm -hmm. That's really fascinating too. Where do you see things going in the next five years? And do you see it? Do you see these different uh, countries evolving at different rates? Or do you see that do you think that they're going to sort of all catch up with each other? And at some point, all of the countries are going to get to a new baseline, but there definitely will be a differential rate in growth. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it has to do with the private sector and the government, the government demanding infrastructure and private companies seeing a market for their products. And that's going to be sort of the limiting fact. I mean, again, NGOs and little health organizations were band-aids when we need to see real change. So just because we distribute phones for a specific program, we're trying to just test the use case. But at the end of the day, it's not sustainable for NGOs to be the groups that are coordinating all of this. It needs to be the government needs to step in or the private sector needs to come up with some kind of business model where they can find some way to create revenue off of these systems. So I think countries like Kenya, Nigeria, a lot of these South Africa are really ahead of the curve, um, whereas a lot of these somewhat more resource and infrastructure poor places like the Gambia or Burundi, I think are seeing a lot more challenges to their growth. But I think eventually in the next 10 to 20 years, there will be enough of a demand from populations in these countries. And again, I'm speaking from the African context. I have not worked in India or Southeast Asia or other parts of the world to really sure. get a sense for what that looks like. But in Africa, I think we will get to a point where there will be a new baseline and the new baseline will be everybody has a phone. Now, one thing I wanted to mention earlier is now we talk about phone access. Um, but I think there also is an interesting shift in the way that we think about phone access. Where here in the United States, we think about, okay, everybody has their own personal phone, whereas shared systems, because of sort of a more community-focused 
concept of the individual where you're not just the one person but you're part of your community so people tend to share things a lot more so mm -hmm. access is more seen as like something that's accessible at the household level so while there are people who do have personal devices for the most part devices tend to be shared across households or they're owned primarily by the male head of the household sure. um, with a lot of these sort of patriarchal systems and there have been projects to look at how can we transfer the power um, of a mobile technology from a man to a woman or provide tools that women can use um, so that way they have more agency. So I think that shift might also occur in the next 10 to 20 years yeah. where everybody has some kind of mobile device that they're using and more and more of those devices will likely be smartphones given how cheap they're getting. I think we will reach a new baseline in the next 10 to 20 years. But again, a lot of that's going to be driven by the government and by the private sector. So things like segmenting a phone into multiple accounts, maybe? Is that a consideration? Yeah, I mean, you there would be utility in that. But at the end of the day, if you can't keep the phone on your personal property with yourself whenever you're going yeah. everywhere, then you sort of lose part of the utility of it. Sure. So even if it has multiple accounts, if it still has to stay with the male head of the household, yeah. then that means everybody else in the household has restrictions or a barrier to access to information, sure. especially when it comes to like private information. Sure. Um, like if you're trying to get information about sexual health or yeah. something like that, then that's not something that you want to have to go and ask dad or <laughs> dad, yeah. can I have the phone? Cause I want to yeah. look up information about reproductive health. Right. So, yeah. So that's a bigger issue. That's more of a, so a social issue, right? Mm -hmm. And getting over those kinds of hurdles of, misogyny and so forth and yeah and, and i think that's not necessarily something that technology will be able to solve directly it's yeah. more just going to be as countries grow economically and prosper yeah. you tend to see more gender equality which then means that women and girls have more agency and have more ownership of technologies so yeah, I think gender equality is, is definitely a very important thing to think about. Or gender drivers, gender drivers are going to be very important things to think about as you're developing technology systems. But I don't think technology is going to be the direct vaccine for it, but rather just as families improve, as countries grow and prosper, then you're going to see more gender equality. That's really fascinating. Did you witness that as being like a hampering effect um, or as like hindering the progress of what you were trying to do in terms of spreading information and things like that? Was that something that you could quantify and say, um, you know, this country has poorer uh, uh, women's health for specifically this, this reason related to their lack of access to technology? It was more of a consideration in how we would design a program rather than necessarily a barrier so for example if you're trying to collect information you have to realize that maybe the female head of the household doesn't have a phone or she might need to have permission from her husband to even speak to us to collect information right i mean sorry regardless yeah. of her phone information if you're a data collector and you're going to a household particularly um we were working in northern nigeria so a lot of muslim households so there were a lot of situations where the male head of the household wasn't present then the woman would not be able to leave the household. And especially if there was a male data collector, then the woman would not be allowed to respond. So that's why a lot of the times our data collectors were women. Mm -hmm. so that way it would be easier for them to be oh. able to engage with sure. other women. This wasn't everyone. I don't want to paint a broad brush, but just as an example of the kinds of sort of things that we had to think about when we were yeah. designing programs. Does that color the collection of, of collecting data from men if you have a woman coming to collect the data um yeah it definitely does depending on the kind of information you're trying to ask so yeah. i think we have to be very careful that if we're trying to collect information i mean this was a lot of the work that i was doing in togo was around gender and reproductive health um and i one of the bears that i found was as a male volunteer my program was trying to encourage us to do more work in sexual reproductive health sure but the people who needed the information were typically women and they didn't feel comfortable talking to me about right. that. So I decided to implement a program called Men as Partners that had been developed in South Africa and it's sort of been implemented in a couple of different places to say, okay, 
How can we create an environment where men feel comfortable talking to other men about sexual reproductive health? And what does that mean for improving the health of women and children? As that relates to surveys that we were trying to collect, we had to be very cognizant of, okay, if we're trying to collect information on gender-based violence, a male data collector is going to probably going to collect more biased information yeah. from a female if they're the ones asking a compared to a female data collector. And that information might also be biased if the male head of the household is present. So sort of thinking about what are the household dynamics right. that are occurring at the time of data collection and what are potential biases that might be influencing why someone is responding the way that they do. And then also, how are you writing the questions in a way that allow you to actually capture the information that you want without leading the person on? Uh, but that's more from like, a, I think those are sort of things that are general to not the context that I'm working for, but you would have to consider that even also yeah. um, in the U.S. to a lesser degree of the whole male data collector, female respondent, but still something to think about. I mean, at the end of the day, if you want to collect good data, the person has to feel comfortable and safe and secure. Sure. So you want to create an environment that allows the person to feel that and understanding the cultural context will allow you to design that system. Yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> We're coming up at the end of the hour, so I like to like look to the future. Sure. Um, was there any talk given towards things like remote diagnosis using either you know wearables, remote sensors, and things like that, or or to just sort of simplify the technology, just a remote consultation with a doctor over mm -hmm. you know video chat or something like that? There have definitely been some organizations that have tried to implement telemedicine so that sort of like remote diagnosis of if you can at least get a hold of a doctor somewhere in the world then and especially if right. you have video capabilities and they can sort of see things through skype or whatever mm -hmm. um so i think those systems have been tested and i think obviously there's a lot of issues around hipaa around security about around okay well if you're not physically able to be with a patient what is the reliability of the information you're actually able to get trying to diagnose something remotely versus in person? And what is the liability you're putting on yourself as a healthcare worker mm -hmm. to do that? And then also from the diagnostic side, as you were mentioning, there are groups that are looking at, okay, how can we take mobile phones and turn them into diagnostic tools? How can we develop add-ons to the iPhone or add-ons to the smartphone so we can like do blood smears? Or how can we collect information? I'm a design consultant for a small design firm out in San Francisco, and we are looking to redesign a medical device. And this medical device is going to be used as sort of a screening tool for pneumonia. Um, and the tool basically is a little device, and it has a sensor, and you attach the sensor to the kid um, or to an adult, and then you'll be able to collect information on oxygen saturation, et cetera. But there was talk about, okay, well, right now the device is sort of proprietary to the company, but what if you could turn the device into something that could be attached to a smartphone, and then all you have to do is develop an application yeah. that can read the algorithm of the data coming in from the sensor. So that would be sort of an example of where we can sort of take medical devices that exist and turn them into things that can then be used using sort of this interoperability thing that we were discuss discussing earlier. Again, it's happening at a slow rate. It will continue to happen faster as private companies identify the markets that will be most useful to these kinds of tools. And there is definitely a demand for these kinds of systems. So yes, I do see a future where a health worker is carrying a smartphone and they're using the smartphone to be able to diagnose minor things and then they can call someone or video Skype with someone over their phone to an actual doctor, either within their country or outside their country, and that becomes the standard of care. I do see that being where technology is going. And then also we were mentioning drones to deliver vaccines or medicines. Like that is where I think we are moving as a global health community, but we are a long ways away. Yeah. And I think, again, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the barriers to that are how do we make these systems sustainable? 
and what does the model look like? Is it the government providing these services or is there some kind of user fee system that a private company would use? Because I think those are really the right. two ways you're going to get something to be sustainable and used throughout the world. But the other thing we have to be careful of is, I mean, so right now, smartphones are how we communicate, but we don't know what the new technology is going to be. Right. I mean, yeah. maybe the next thing is everybody uses Google Glass and like yeah. that's how we're communicating. So then yeah. how can we adapt these tools for the next technology that's down the pipeline? So again, as I mentioned earlier, we need to think about how are we designing these systems such that they're interoperable so that they, yes, they can work now on a smartphone, but we'll, we'll be prepared to still be functional and usable whenever the next new big technology comes out. I don't know what that's going to look like, mm -hmm. but we have to be prepared for it because technology is constantly changing. So we need to take that into consideration as we're designing tools. You worked on a couple of programs around clean water. Did you find that technology was being used as a way to, was it being used as a way to identify areas that were problematic or what role did it play in, in those campaigns? Sure. Um, so I actually have not really done a lot of work around technology as it relates to water sanitation. I think a cool project that a friend of mine worked on, they were working in central Karnataka in India, um, which is actually where my dad is from. And there was this issue of, okay, there's a central water treatment facility and then they're releasing clean water through pipes to communities, but they don't necessarily just have the water running full time. They only have water maybe a couple hours a day and that, that schedule is inconsistent. So whenever people would go to their pipes in their communities or in their house, they'd go there not knowing whether there was water or not. Wow. Um, and usually it would have to travel through word of mouth. So net, what this NGO came up with was basically they connected a mobile system where people would receive SMS alerts when there was water and when there was not water. So that way it facilitated people could sort of better, not plan, but they wouldn't waste a trip to a water point unless they knew water was actually going to be there when they arrived. So that was like a cool little thing. And I think that's something that's fairly easy to scale up to a national level. Yeah. So a lot of these things are sort of thinking about what are the problems that people are experiencing and then where exactly can technology play a role in sort of making it easier. Now, obviously, if this facility was just able to provide clean water full time, then that system would not be necessary anymore. Right. So that's why you don't necessarily need something like that for here in Boston, for example. Right. But in Detroit. Um, <laughs> yes, exactly. Is possibly. the water clean today? And then another example is a friend, of, um, two friends of mine um, have a company called M Water, uh -huh. and they are part of a larger collective just trying to map water points and map where there is clean water and where there isn't clean water. So they have trained people to go out and basically test water on a routine basis and then map that information so people have access to this global map and they can see, right. okay, does this water source have clean water? If yes, then I can go there and collect water. And yeah. if not, then I can go to a different water point to collect water. So yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a, a couple different ways that people are using technology, but it's not something that I have direct experience. So sure. I'm still sort of learning about what that looks like. But that's, that's actually one of my big interests. I mean, it's one of the big research questions I want to answer, not necessarily through my dissertation, but in general is I'm really interested in how can we better utilize spatial data to inform and improve programming in water sanitation and hygiene programs around the world. So not just collecting GPS points, but also looking at other spatial data imagery that we might be able to collect and use it to inform the way that programs are designed. Um, or what can we use it to better understand about the relationship? So for example, a paper um, that I'm currently working on is looking at, can we use spatial data to better understand social networks? And then what does that mean for how information around use of a specific water technology is being sort of promulgated throughout the network. Sure. Cool. I just need some kind of app that can help me like identify how much chicken poop is on my <laughs> kids feet when they come in the house. Cause I think it's a lot. Yes. That's... I'm pretty sure. Just one last question. Sure. What, out of everything that you worked on, what did, what were you most impressed by? I think I was most impressed by the ingenuity and how creative people are. Um, I think one issue that doesn't necessarily get talked about 
as much as it should is just because you develop a product that's not the end of the cycle you have to have systems in place to sort of maintain and operate those systems because technology breaks and when technology breaks if you don't have the systems in place to be able to repair um then basically you've created a product that no one is going to use anymore yeah and a lot of times products are not designed for a lot of the environments that I was working in. So for example, in Northern Nigeria, it can get very hot, which means your smartphone is going to overheat. Yeah. We were trying to make sure that we were using technologies that were actually very durable for those very harsh environments. But you, you could be in some of the most remote places and if something breaks, they will, if they want something to work, they will find a way to make it work. And just as an example, when I was in Togo, people drive cars, um, you have taxi drivers, and these are very, very, very old cars. And somehow people are still getting them to work. And we would joke that you'd get in a car and you wouldn't necessarily know how somebody was going to start the car, because sometimes <laughs> they would be they would put the key in the ignition and turn the key and the key and the, and the car would start. Sometimes they'd have to like, turn on the windshield wipers three times press the radio button and then turn it off three seconds later <laughs> and spit out the window and then the car would start. Yeah. So they're sort of taking systems and bypassing them in ways to get things to work if they need something to work. Mm -hmm. So I think just realizing that there is that spirit of if we find something valuable and it breaks, we will find a way to fix it. And that sort of energy and ingenuity has always really impressed me. Do you have any examples of any technologies that have sort of come back to the U.S.? Yeah. So w while I wouldn't say mobile money is something that was necessarily invented or created abroad, I think people have tried to develop systems for mobile money in the U.S. and just haven't been very successful. But I think the first successful use case actually comes from the, from the developing world, specifically Kenya. Um, and I think there were a lot of factors around why Safaricom and their M-Pesa system um, was so successful, mainly because Safaricom at the time was sort of a monopoly. So because people only really had access to one telecommunications provider, they were sort of able to sort of build systems around that on the assumption that because everybody who has a smartphone would access only Safaricom, then Safaricom can control where the money goes. But basically, M-Pesa is this really cool system where you can transfer money from your M-Pesa account to somebody else's M-Pesa account. And then there are stations of, with real people um, throughout the country in grocery stores on the side of the road where you can give actual Kenyan shillings to someone and then they'll convert it into your mobile bank account. And then you can transfer money from your mobile bank account to another user. And then that person can then go to any M-Pesa station and give them their phone number and then they can withdraw actual money if they need that. Mm -hmm. So that was there when I was living in Kenya and it had been around for a while. And I remember being like, wow, this is brilliant. Why doesn't the system ex exist in the U.S.? And I think now with, with the Cash App and Venmo and those kinds of things, like those are becoming a lot yeah. easier to use here. But at the time... I had only really seen a successful use case in Kenya and hadn't really okay. seen it elsewhere. Even when I moved to Nigeria, um, I was like, oh, great. Like we can just do these, we can use, um, we can do mobile payments for, for community health workers or enumerators in the field. And they were like, nope, that system doesn't really exist that well here because there are four telecommunications providers. There's not really a lot of interoperability between um, the four providers. So it would be much more challenging to sort of develop that kind of system. But in Kenya, it worked for a lot of different factors, specifically around the idea around that Safaricom was basically a monopoly. So since everybody was using the same system, it's easier to sort of manage the money money through that. So um, you're not talking about like a blockchain technology like no. Bitcoin. This is more of like a cash to credit yes. kind of idea. Yeah, exactly. A much simpler concept, really. Yeah, exactly. It's just having an authority that everybody trusts that yeah. is going to behave responsibly and reliably. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then speaking of speaking of Bitcoin and blockchain, I think people are looking for ways to use that 
in the developing world, but I think it hasn't still quite caught on. I mean, it still hasn't really caught on that much in the United States either. Yeah. And a lot of what we're doing now is saying, okay, well, it's not so much the Bitcoin, but the blockchain technology, which is really interesting. So how can we use blockchain specifically to encrypt and transmit information? Yeah. Um, so I think that'll sort of be, I don't necessarily know Bitcoin specifically is going to catch on, um, but in terms of mobile money, I think there are now more systems in place um, with Safaricom and M-Pesa being a really good model. And it's really important because we used M-Pesa all the time to pay people in the field for our programs and having a way to do that remotely is really important. So hopefully there will be more institutions and private companies to try to figure out a way to implement a Venmo or a cash type system um, in a lot of these countries that we're working in. Awesome. Nikhil, do you want to give out some contact information if anybody wants to get a hold of you? Sure. Um, so probably you're welcome to contact me over Twitter. Uh, my handle is at N-P-A-T-I-L-5-5, N-P-A-T-I-L-5-5. Um, that's also my handle at Instagram. Um, and I tend to sort of use Twitter to connect with other tech professionals doing tech in the global health community. So it's a great way to sort of keep in touch with me there. And I try to sort of take pictures on Instagram to show some of the work that I do. Um, or you can go back and look at some of the old pictures that I've taken from my time in Africa. So that would be another place if you want to connect with me and see some of the work that I was working on or the companies that I was working for, the work that they were doing. Awesome. And I'll include those links um, in the blog page uh, for this episode uh, on propellix.com as well. So people can look there. I'd also like to let everyone know that we have a webinar coming up uh, October 12th, 2017 at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And the topic of the webinar is What Can Mobile Tech Do for Your Sales Organization in 2018? Um, so if you want to register for that, you can do so by going to our news and events page at propellix.com. Nikhil, thanks so much for coming by, man. You are very welcome. Thanks so much for inviting me to be a part of this. And uh, thank you, everybody, for checking out another episode of Device Squad, the podcast for the mobile enterprise from Propellix. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. So just got to ask you, did you do any work in uh, Nambia? <laughs> Um, no, I did not do, I have not done any work in Nambia and I don't think anyone in the world except maybe Donald Trump has done work in Nambia. If he meant Zambia or Namibia or Gambia, I have not worked in either of those three <laughs> countries either, but I have definitely not worked in Nambia. Well, you know, at least he didn't say Zimbabwe.